It is now time for oral questions. I recognize the member for Brampton Centre. Thank you. Uh, good morning, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Health experts uh, confirmed more cases of the Omicron variant yesterday here in Ontario, and four public health units have new restrictions to prevent further COVID-19 spread in their communities. This government has promised to use every tool to help contain the spread of this virus, but that simply hasn't happened. We need better testing, tracing, and isolation of cases. But the government must also mandate vaccinations for health and education workers so that our hospitals and schools are safer for patients, students, and staff. Why won't the Premier do what's right to keep people safe, starting with mandatory vaccinations for health and education workers? And to reply on behalf of the government, the Deputy Premier and Minister of Health. Thank you very much, uh, Speaker, and thank you to the member opposite for the question. Uh, we have taken every precaution possible. We are working with the federal government in order to uh, prevent people from traveling from several South African countries right now. There may be other countries that will be added to this list. We are also asking the federal government to initiate point of arrival testing for all people arriving in Canada, regardless of where they come from, because we know that there is some spread of the Omicron variant. However, we are ready for whatever might happen. We have a very robust testing strategy. We have expanded our locations. We have 230 assessment centers that are open and over 500 pharmacies with more coming online. We also have boots on the ground for case and contact management. There are 375 people that have been identified as having been in those countries, South African countries, within the last 14 days. Response. We are following up with all of them and doing the proper gene sequencing to make sure that we understand what we're dealing with, whether it's Omicron or another variety. So Ontario is ready for whatever might happen. The supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker. What we've learned uh, from this pandemic is that being cautious has helped reduce the spread of the virus. The government should be adapting their plan and, and make uh, paid sick days actually permanent, uh, instead of taking them away from workers at the end of this year. That would give certainty to workers and workplaces, for example, in Brampton, uh, to know that if those workers get sick, that the government has their back. Most experts in this province, including the Premier's own science table, has called for permanent paid sick days. Why isn't the Premier doing what's right for Ontario and ensuring that workers in this province have paid sick days before they expire on December 31st? Government House Leader. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Of course, uh, the uh, the Premier has uh, has led on this issue, frankly, right uh, right from the very beginning. We knew how important it was to ensure that uh, the people of the province of Ontario, especially those uh, those uh, frontline workers, uh, were supported, Mr. Speaker. That's why the, the Premier negotiated with our federal partners uh, an over $1 billion program to bring 23 paid sick days uh, to the people of the province of Ontario. We understand, of course, how important it is to continue to, uh, to support Ontario frontline workers. That is why there continues to be a program in place uh, for workers, and we will, of course, always be there uh, for workers as we battle our way through this pandemic. Mr. Speaker, there's a lot of work yet to do, uh, but we are well on our way as a province uh, to, uh, uh, to really to doing fabulous things. We have uh, almost 90% uh, of our population uh, with uh, two uh, vaccine doses, and I'm, uh, I'm told, Mr. Speaker, that uh, a significant, a significant number of those Response. five and 11 have registered or are getting their vaccines, uh, Speaker. So uh, we're well on our way, and it's because of the hard work of the people of the province of Ontario. And the final supplementary. Speaker, in addition to taking away sick days, the government plans on stopping the use of vaccine certificates that Ontarians have been using to help support our local businesses. All of this comes to an end on January 17th because the government isn't taking the fourth wave and this new variant seriously enough. Speaker, the ICUs are filling up, public health units are bringing back restrictions, and 10,000 people have lost their lives in Ontario due to COVID-19. People have suffered enough. And the last thing this province needs or anybody wants is another lockdown. We can prevent that. Why is the Premier scrapping vaccine certificates when we could use them to prevent another province-wide lockdown here in Ontario? Minister of Health. Uh, and uh, thank you again to the member for the question. Um, the loss of any life is, is uh, extremely sad, and we, um, our condolences go 
to the families of those who have lost family members. However, we are ready. We are taking this uh, situation very seriously with this new uh, sequence of uh, this new variant. The, uh, and, and when we first announced our plan to reopen Ontario, Dr. Moore, our Chief Medical Officer of Health, was uh, very adamant in saying that this is the plan. However, if there is a dramatic change in circumstances, such as what might be prevented by this new variant, we still don't know enough about it to be able to make that determination, even though we are proceeding very cautiously. Uh, we, we don't know what we're dealing with, but we will be ready for it. But Dr. Moore did indicate that if there is that change in circumstances, we will have to modify that plan. But it's too soon to say right now. We are taking the necessary precautions, but if we have to move those dates out That's again, we will certainly do that to protect the health and safety of all Ontarians. Thank you. The next question, once again, the member for Brampton Centre. Thank you, Speaker. My question again is to the Premier. The Premier knows that $15 an hour just doesn't cut it. Last week, he said, and I'll quote, let's face it, that's a beginning wage. It's tough for anyone to survive on $15, end quote. But his own low-wage policies don't help. Ontarians know it's getting harder and harder to make ends meet. Housing costs have skyrocketed. Hydro and gas and insurance are all up. And food banks, Speaker, are experiencing the highest usage since 2009 because people are struggling to put food on their table for their families. It doesn't have to be this way. Will the Premier support our call to increase the minimum wage to $20 by 2026? Well, well, Speaker, it, it, is, it is really difficult to know where the NDP is, uh, is on this, uh, Mr. Speaker. They seem to, on a daily basis, change their position with respect to that, uh, Mr. Speaker. In fact, uh, on the day that we made that announcement, uh, if I'm not mistaken, members of the NDP were still presenting position, petitions to the House for calling for a $15 a day uh, a child uh, or a minimum wage, Mr. Speaker. So what we have done is we've made sure that the uh, the economy is in a position where we can support a $15 a day uh, minimum wage. Mr. Speaker, the NDP will, of course, know the devastation that was left behind in the province of Ontario. 300,000 manufacturing jobs had left the province. The min member in her own question talked about the high hydro rates. Talked, uh, the Minister of, uh, of Education has talked about the over 400% in increase in child care. There were so many things that were discouraging Response. jobs and investments in the province of Ontario. We had to turn that around. We have, Mr. Speaker, the climate is there where we can support our workers, and this economy will begin to thrive like it has never done before, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Thank you. And a supplementary question. Speaker, I think it's important to note that the minimum wage would actually be higher than $15 right now if the Premier hadn't cancelled the planned increase when it was slated to happen. But he made things even worse for workers and froze the minimum wage and kept it low for three Order. years. The Premier himself has said, he and his family could not make ends meet on $15 an hour. So why is he forcing working families in Ontario to live on $15 an hour? People shouldn't have to turn to the food banks or worry about how they're going to pay their bills, Speaker. Will the Premier do the right thing and support our plan to get workers a $20 minimum wage in a stable, steady and predictable way? Uh, Mr. Speaker, there is so much to unpack in that question. We brought forward a $15 minimum wage because the timing was right to do that, because we are starting to see the economy change, Mr. Speaker, principally because of the policies of this Premier. The NDP could have helped us on that, Mr. Speaker. They could have voted for those uh, when we were first brought into office, Mr. Speaker. They could have voted for those tax reductions that we brought in place to help the lowest income earners in the province of Ontario. They chose to vote against that, Mr. Speaker. They could have helped us and voted with uh, the uh, initiative is brought forward by the Minister of Labour to ensure uh, that there are more people in the trades. These are good, high-paying jobs, Mr. Speaker, that will lead to thousands of people having the dignity of, of a well-paying job. The NDP voted against that, Mr. Speaker. They could have voted in favour of what the Minister of Education was doing to make childcare more affordable after 15 Fox. years of supporting the Liberals who saw increases to childcare of over 400%. They voted against that, Mr. Speaker. Affordability and making life affordable for Ontarians is something that we are proud of. Thank you very much. The final supplementary. Speaker, whether a worker is stocking grocery store shelves, cleaning a hospital, 
or any other important frontline work, they deserve respect. But as the Premier has admitted, $15 an hour as a minimum wage simply isn't going to cut it. Respect is not just saying thank you to these workers at press conferences, but it's actually about paying these workers a wage that pays their bills. Everyone is feeling the squeeze right now, Speaker. A steady, stable path to a $20 minimum wage will help workers make ends meet and will help end the Premier's low-wage policies. Will the Premier do the right thing and support our plan that respects workers with a $20 an hour minimum wage increase and recognize them for their hard work? And to respond. Well, thank, thank you uh, to, to my colleague across the aisle. Mr. Speaker, I want to remind the people of Ontario that under their leadership, with their, with their buddies, the Liberals, again, as my colleague said, we lost 300,000 jobs. That's 300,000 people that couldn't pay rent. That's 300,000 people couldn't put food on the table because of their policies, Mr. Speaker. We took a different approach. We made sure we created an environment that, that companies can come here and thrive and grow. And we, we saw 307,000 more people gain, gain employment that they could put towards rent, that they could put down on a deposit for, to buy a home. Under the NDP and the Liberals' policies, they destroyed this province for 15 years. For 15 years, Mr. Speaker, they, they always focus on, they want the government, the, the people of Ontario to rely on the government. That's your policy. Rely on the government and have the nanny state. We don't believe in that, Mr. Speaker. The next question, the member for Davenport. Good morning, Mr. Speaker. Uh, this question is for the Premier. Speaker, a lot has been asked of Ontarians during this very long and lingering pandemic. People across the province have made enormous sacrifices to keep each other safe and keep our economy moving. There was an understanding, I think, that the government would have their back. In fact, I remember the Premier said he'd do whatever it takes to protect our communities and help us recover. Imagine then, Speaker, what a shock it was for Ontarians to learn in the latest FAO report that over the first two quarters of this year, this government spent $4.3 billion less than it planned. How can the Premier possibly justify shortchanging Ontarians at such a fragile point in our province's recovery? And to apply the President of the Treasury Board. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. And uh, since the beginning of this pandemic, the government has been committed to leveraging the province's fiscal firepower to support the people of this province and businesses. Uh, Mr. Speaker, this was front and center during the public estimates where it showed that this uh, uh, province spent $19.1 billion supporting uh, the pandemic response and, and COVID in the province. Uh, in fact, this represented the largest year over year dollar increase in program spending on record. Uh, in addition to this, Mr. Speaker, this year, our, our government continues to invest uh, in our critical health care uh, infrastructure uh, by supporting uh, uh, those investments through the fall economic statement, uh, which was revealed uh, this past uh, uh, month as well. That committed to supporting and expanding home and community Response. care, committed to supporting and increasing our health care investments across the province. And the supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Fiscal firepower? Well, that sure fizzled out. Speaker, I'm not sure the minister understands the seriousness of this. At a time when the success or failure of, of reopening depended on keeping transmission down, this government underspent on public health by $600 million. While parents were preparing for their children's return to school and demanding a safe September, this government spent $700 million less than planned on education. And while the government was making deals with their developer buddies to pave over the greenbelt, the budget for municipal transit projects was left untouched. Speaker, through you to the Premier, why on earth would he withhold funding at a time when the people of this province needed it most? Again, the President of the Treasury Board. Well, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. And as the member opposite know, the, the expenditure monitor is a, a point in time uh, estimates based on specific data 
uh, requested by the FAO. It also doesn't take into full consideration the, uh, the government's investments as it excludes consolidated entities such as school boards, hospitals, and agencies. But, Mr. Speaker, our government uh, uh, committed to, to the largest expenditure in this province's history in supporting our frontline health care workers, supporting our education sector, supporting our hospitals, Mr. Speaker. And uh, that was over $16.7 billion last year. That was the largest year over year dollar increase in program spending in the, uh, on, in this his, in the history books of this uh, province. And that included investing in mental health, included in 3,100 new beds uh, to support uh, uh, the province's response to, to COVID-19. And, Mr. Speaker, we will continue to unleash the, the province's fi fiscal firepower to support uh, people, uh, our health care system, and businesses across this sure. province. Sure. Next question, the member for Halliburton, Kawartha Lake, Sprague. My question is for the Minister of Colleges and Universities. Speaker, the COVID-19 pandemic has highlighted the importance of health care workers. Unfortunately, there is a currently a shortage of nurses here in Ontario. The combination of the pandemic and an aging population has increased the urgency to address health care shortages. And with such a clear shortage, we must work to fill the gaps. So, Mr. Speaker, can the minister tell us what substantial action she has taken to address the nursing shortage in Ontario, and will the minister pledge to creating more nursing spots and programs by the 2022 academic year? Great to respond, Minister of Colleges and Universities. Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the member from Halliburton, Kawartha Lakes, Brock, for highlighting such an important and key issue. This past year, the COVID-19 pandemic has shown all of us how critical nurses are to our health care system. In fact, Mr. Speaker, our government has gone above and beyond to address the nursing shortage in Ontario. Specifically, in my ministry, we have worked closely with colleges and universities to create programs in order to maintain excellence in nursing education while expanding choices for students. This past month, our government said yes to new standalone four-year Bachelor of Science in Nursing degree programs at Seneca College's King Campus and York University. These new programs are in addition to the 16 universities and 23 colleges offering bachelorette nursing programs in collaborative partnerships. Through allowing colleges and universities to have standalone degrees, our government is increasing choices and reducing barriers to access high-quality local education for students. This is a Bonds. bold and progressive move under our government that will provide students with more choices for nursing education further strengthening our health care workforce as more Ontarians pursue this important career path. Thank you. The supplementary question. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the minister for that answer. I am delighted to hear that the government is currently taking steps to address the nursing shortage and respond to the needs of our current health care system. When we consider a problem as important as the nursing shortage, we must also consider regional differences and needs of varying health care units. In a province as large as Ontario, different communities have drastically different local health care needs. Additionally, one problem that many students encounter when trying to get a nursing education is having a lack of local options. The, this causes barriers and further accentuates the gap between nursing shortages in communities across Ontario. So, Mr. Speaker, can the minister please tell me what she has done to address the regional barriers that students face to access nursing education close to home in order to address nursing shortages across Question. the province? And the response, Minister of Colleges and Universities. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thanks again to the member for that question. I am proud to say that our government understands that we must address the nursing shortage through increasing both spots and creating more accessible local programs. We are a government for the students, and we have worked hard increasing choices and reducing barriers to high-quality local education for Ontario students. I believe that students in small towns and students in big cities should have the same opportunities and choice when starting post-secondary education. That is why, in recent months, our announcements of new standalone nursing degree programs at Georgia College, St. Lawrence, York and Seneca will add to the existing 36 nursing programs at colleges and universities across Ontario. Having nursing programs available in Kingston, Belleville, Barrie, Owen Sound, and King City, Ontario's nurses go above and beyond to provide exceptional care to patients, and it is my Response. job to ensure we make life easier for students in all regions who choose such an important career path. Next question, member for London Thank you, Speaker. And my question is to the Premier. 
By now, families and kids across the province are used to this government's double speak regarding the Ontario Autism Program. This is a this. Yeah, I'm going to caution the member on her use of language. Speaker, by now, families and kids across this province are used to this government's confusing talk around the Ontario Autism Program. This is a premier that promised to clear the wait list on the campaign trail only to have it balloon to 50,000 kids after taking power. This is a government that dismantled an existing functioning program to build one it calls a gold standard. Nearly every parent and advocate will tell you that it is far from it. This is a government that repeatedly bragged about doubling down the budget, doubling the budget for the autism Ontario Autism Program, but yesterday's Financial Accountability Office's report shows that you've actually underspent on the program by over $100 million. How do you think it feels to be a child who has been without necessary therapies for over a thousand days? How do you think it feels to be a parent and find out that this government has been underspending on the program while you go further and further into debt to provide care Question. for your kid? Can the Premier explain why they underspent on the budget and what they plan to do to rectify it? And to respond on behalf of the government, Minister of Children, Community and Social Services. Thank you, Speaker. And I appreciate the question from the, the member opposite and, and the opportunity to, uh, to uh, give the facts. Our government has doubled the funding for the Ontario Autism Program from $300 million to $600 million. We have almost five times as many children receiving services right now. 40,000 children are receiving services. That is, as I said, five times as many more children as, as previously. The previous government promised a program and only delivered services to 25% of eligible children, leaving 23,000 children without care. 33,000 actually uh, invitations have been put out uh, for, for children to come in um, to the program. 11,000 um, invitations have been put out for the childhood benefits. This is a world leading program. It is a continuum of care. It involves mental health services that were never provided before. This is by the community for the community. As Thank you very much. Please supplement your question. Speaker. That's not the case. This government recently announced it would be enrolling a total of 8,000 kids in the OAP by the fall of 2022. Remember, the wait list is 50,000 kids long, and it's that long because of this government's actions. The majority of kids on the wait list have been waiting without service for over 100,000 days. A thousand days. Every day matters to these kids. Every parent worries about their child's future, but especially a parent whose child is growing up without the supports they need to thrive. Cynthia, a parent in London whose son is waiting to be enrolled in the OAP, asked me, quote, how is this Ontario? And is this how we are treating someone on dis with a disability? The person that you're giving the short end of the stick to is a three-year-old kid, end quote. Premier, what do you have to say to Cynthia and her son and the 50,000 kids that remain on the wait list that you promised to clear? Mr. Chairman, Community and Social Services. Thank you, Speaker. And once again, I appreciate the opportunity to clarify uh, the important work that's been done by the autism community for the autism community to make sure that those the 50,000 children that are registered for this program are going to be receiving their care, of which 40,000 already are receiving services. You know, back in uh, 2018, when our government came in, there were 31,500 people registered for the program, and only 8,500 were receiving support. Our government said we must do better for those children and for those families, and now there are five times as many children receiving services than ever before. This is a huge improvement. We've provided foundational family services. Uh, all children who have a diagnosis of autism have, the, uh, have access Spons? to services, to funded services. We provided the early intervention services to help young children receive the critical services that they need in their development, understanding this is a needs-based program, that it is evidence-based, that it is clinically informed and research. Thank you very much for the reply. The next question, the member for Chatham Kent Leamington. Thanks, Speaker. And my, uh, my question is to the Minister of Health. 
Many people have succumbed to the pressures of getting vaccinated by their employers or be fired. Many aren't given reasonable accommodation to have rapid antigen testing to save their jobs. They're in danger of losing their homes, providing for their families, and downside results continue to climb. Vaccination should be about freedom of choice. The Premier stated mandatory vaccines in health care has been dropped, yet many of the Ontario health teams are telling hospitals in their areas that mandatory vaccine will remain in place. So nothing changes. And people continue to lose their jobs, creating a health care crisis. Truthfully, Speaker, no one can tell me what changed from yesterday to today. Yesterday, workers were safe, using proper COVID protocols, providing for their families, going to arenas to watch their kids play hockey, and frequent restaurants. So, Minister, what's changed? We are now a two-tier society, splitting families, putting neighbor against neighbor, and forcing business to turn away patrons. Is that what you and the government really want? Minister of Health to reply. Speaker, and thank you to the member for the question. I think the short answer to your question is because we're in a pandemic. We're in a pandemic, and we need to save people's lives. That's my responsibility as Minister of Health. That's our responsibility as government. That's why we've had to take these measures. Nobody wants to do any of this, but we have to. We've had to improvise, not improvise, we've had to implement measures in order to save people's lives before the vaccine was available. Now that the vaccine is available, we're asking everyone, especially with this new variant of concern, we still need to know more about it, but it's all the more important for people People to be vaccinated. If you haven't made your appointment, I'm urging all people to please go out and be vaccinated now. If you're ready to receive a booster shot, please go and get that. We are going to be looking at changing the age requirements for people to be eligible to receive the booster, and there will be more information ab available about that later this week. Response. And please consider having your children vaccinated as well, ages 5 to 11. That's the way that we prevent this vaccine from spreading and that we can all return to our lives as they used to be. Supplementary. Back to the minister. We know vaccine development, testing, and regulation is a painstaking process that takes years of dedication and hard work to complete. COVID-19 products have not gone through the same process and rigor. Long-term safety and efficacy data that is crucial for assessment is not available. What's worse, various injury reporting databases show immediate effects of vax-caused injuries and deaths has quickly reached unprecedented levels. Public Health Ontario, as of November 14, reported 537 cases of myocarditis and thousands of adverse events following immunization. And now parents can register their 5 to 11-year-olds to be injected. Healthy children are at a minimal risk of severe outcomes like hospitalizations from COVID-19. Minister, considering the above points, will Question. you provide the legislature with better rationale for the decisions to vaccinate children other than saying these vaccines are safe? Minister of Health. Well, these vaccines are safe. I can assure the member of that. They've gone through rigorous testing protocols. They, we're very fortunate that we have the technology now that we are able to have these vaccines available for adults as well as for children. We know that many parents still have questions about the concerns they have for, with respect to vaccinating their children age 5 to 11, and that's why we have information available. We understand that there will be questions, and that's why we have a partnership with the Hospital for Sick Children for parents to call to ask those questions and then to have their children vaccinated. This is extremely important because right now we know that a third of the new cases of COVID um, are occurring among school-aged children, so it's all the more reason for parents to protect their children to have them vaccinated, which protects their children, their loved ones, and their community. Response. This is absolutely important, and we urge everyone to please move forward, have your questions answered, and please have your children vaccinated. Thank you. The next question, the member for Renfrew, Nipissing, Pembroke. Thank you, Speaker. <clears throat> Speaker, it's been one week since five to 11 year olds became eligible for vaccinations in Ontario. I know many parents have been very happy to make appointments for their children this past week. I've heard from parents in my riding who have been eager to schedule appointments since news on childhood vaccines came out. As COVID-19 cases continue to rise with Ontarians moving inside this holiday season, I know many parents would be glad to have an additional level of protection for their children. Could the minister please tell the House how many parents have booked doses for their children and when they can expect to receive their dose? Again, the Minister of Health. 
Thank you, Speaker, and thank you very much to the member from Renfrew, Nipissing, Pembroke for the question. I am very proud, Mr. Speaker, of our success in the vaccine rollout, which has resulted in one of the highest vaccination rates in the world. As of this week, we have reached almost 90% of the population 12 years and older, having received their first dose. And as of last Tuesday, children aged 5 to 11 are eligible to book an appointment to receive the vaccine. Already, over 150,000 appointments have been successfully booked, and over 86,000 children have already received their first vaccine. That's in one week, Speaker. I'm also pleased to advise that many public health units like Toronto are continuing to add more locations to their rollout, including school and community-based clinics. The supplementary. Thank you, Speaker, and I would like to thank the minister for her response. Many parents in my <clears throat> excuse me, many parents in my riding are excited that their children are now able to benefit from the protection of the COVID-19 vaccine. This will ensure that they can continue to do the activities they love, whether it's at school or on the weekend. I know some parents have reached out to myself and my colleagues with questions surrounding childhood vaccinations and would like more information before booking an appointment. Speaker, can the minister tell us where constituents who have questions or are just not sure yet where they can go for more information? Minister of Health. Well, thank you again to the member for the question and for your interest in this very important consideration. Uh, I'd like to start by saying that we know vaccines are safe and the most effective way of preventing COVID-19. But we also understand that many parents have questions, and it's okay to have questions about the COVID-19 vaccine. I've heard from many parents too, and I understand the importance of making sure your children have the best protection possible, which is why parents, caregivers, and children are encouraged to call the Provincial Vaccine Confidence Line that can be accessed by calling the Provincial Vaccine Contact Centre at 1-833-943 3900 or visit COVID-19 Vaccine Consult Service to book a confidential phone appointment with a sick kids clinician. Speaker, we look forward to getting one step closer to all Ontarians having safe and effective protection against COVID-19. Thank you very much. The next question, the member for University Rose. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Health. In March 2019, the Ford government cut its funding to Kensington Market's overdose prevention site run by St Stephen's Community House. And this decision has had real-life devastating consequences. In the last month alone, two people living near Kensington Market have died of suspected overdoses. Through donations, St Stephen's is doing everything they can to provide critical services to our community. But without provincial funding, many more people in Kensington are unable to connect with the services they need to stay alive. Services like harm reduction, primary care, mental health care, supportive housing and supervised injection sites. Premier, Minister of Health, can you help our community save lives by restoring funding to St Stephen's overdose prevention site? And to respond, the Associate Minister of Mental Health and Addictions. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And thank you for that important question. Mr. Speaker, our function since we first came to government was to ensure that we build continuums of care throughout the province of Ontario to help everyone where and when that help is needed. <clears throat> We've created and worked with police to build mobile intervention crisis teams. We've worked to build OATs to assist individuals. We've invested in consumption and treatment sites. We've built and are building continuums of care throughout the province of Ontario. We've made investments, just recently $32.7 million for addiction supports for individuals in need of help throughout the province of Ontario. And we will continue making those investments as we've indicated we would through the investments of $3.8 billion over 10 years, which now has We've achieved $525 million in annualized funding to support the mental health and addiction needs of the people of the province of Ontario. And the supplementary question. Uh, back to the Minister of Health. Opioid deaths in Ontario have risen by a staggering 79% since the start of a pandemic. And if you are in the homeless population, the 
Overdose, dying of an overdose is the number one reason why you're going to die. Minister, people in my riding are dying from preventable overdose deaths because they don't have access to supportive housing. In the midst of this crisis, instead of helping our community, this government is choosing to cut funding to municipalities and housing. Minister, we don't need cuts, we need help. The City of Toronto has requested $48 million in funding to provide 2,000 new supportive housing units to help house people who have no homes. These are the people sleeping in parks. These are the people who need homes now. Minister, can your government help Toronto address our homelessness Question. crisis by providing more funding to supportive housing? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And once again, what I'd like to begin with is explaining that a continuum of care is more than just providing the supports initially, such as the access points that I mentioned in, in the previous uh, response, but it's also to ensure that there are the wraparound services for individuals. And that's why our government has taken a multi-ministerial approach to looking at the issues that need to be resolved and is making investments through the $525 million and will continue to make investments along with and supported by the Minister of Housing to ensure that individuals seek the treatment and are able to access it, are able to come out of the treatment and then have the wraparound supports and services that are necessary to ensure that they will have success after that treatment. So our government has made those investments, is continuing to make those investments, and has laid the foundation through the Roadmap to Wellness to ensure Spons. that those systems are put in place to assist individuals, regardless of whether they're homeless or have construction jobs and need supports. And the next question, the member for Ottawa Vanier. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and uh, Mr. Speaker, to the Premier, uh, in just over three years, this government has issued 57 ministerial zoning orders. This is more than triple the amount the previous government issued over 15 years. The MZOs issued by this government have been used to bypass environmental protections and reward politically connected developers. We should be building within the existing boundaries of cities, but the PCs are using MZOs to enable endless suburban sprawl into protected nature and farmland. The Auditor General's report has said that the government violated Ontarians' environmental rights by not consulting on projects. My question is, does the government think that they have shown accountability in due consultation in the use of MZOs? And to reply, the Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. Thanks, Speaker. Today, the leader of the Liberal Party announced that he would say Even no to 500 supportive housing units. Okay. He'd say no to building housing for our homeless Dave. veterans. Dave he'd Brooke. say no to expanding Sunnybrook Hospital, wow. and he'd even say no, Speaker, to expanding 37 long-term care beds in our province. The reason, Speaker, we're in a housing supply a problem in this in this province and and problems in our long-term care is because of the 15 years yep. that this government yeah. said no. Yeah. Under Morales. Premier Ford and our government, we're saying yes to building more yeah. homes. We're yeah. saying yes to building more long-term care, and we're saying yes to building more transit. We're the only party speaker that will say yes to Ontario. Yeah. 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 Supplementary question. Mr. Speaker, according to the housing market information available, the use of MZOs has been a failure in terms of increasing housing supply. Less housing is being built under this government than there was under the previous one. MZOs are not a substitute for comprehensive reform to allow for more multifamily housing to be built. Ontario Liberals have a plan to scrap the existing MZO process and replace it with a new rules-based approach. Does the government have a plan, a real plan, to increase housing supply, or will they keep selectively allowing certain developers to build when it suits the Premier? Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. Duca says, Del Duca. All MZOs issued on non-provincially owned land 
has come at the request of the municipal council yeah. and a supporting council resolution. They're not forced on municipalities. You know, Stephen Del Duca will tell you that he's against MZOs, but what you'll hear is his plan is exactly like ours. And in fact, Speaker, you know, the member opposite mentioned some MZOs that their government did. Uh, in 2009, they gave an MZO for a golf dome. In 2006, in Markham, they gave a MZO for an outdoor golf driving range. In 2008, Speaker, in Pickering, they made an MZO for an outdoor golf driving range. In 2013, in Oakville, they made an MZO for an outdoor golf driving range. Oh, speaker, I, I like golf order. as much as the next guy, like but we've got to build Spons. affordable housing. We've got to build long-term care. We're going to continue to say yes to those priorities. Stop the clock. Stop the clock. Please start the clock. The next question, the member for Peterborough Kawartha. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'd like to thank the member from Ottawa Vanier for setting the table for my question. My question is for the Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. Speaker, I hear from my constituents continuously about the housing market and the difficulty in entering it. The previous Liberal government sat on their hands for 15 years and did absolutely nothing to address the housing crisis, but they did fix the golfing crisis. Young families, seniors, and hardworking Ontarians are desperate for housing that meets their unique needs. I understand that the Premier and the Minister intend on hosting a housing affordability summit with the province's big city mayors and chairs to discuss this critical issue. My constituents and many Ontarians are eager to know more. So, Speaker, can the Minister please inform this House on what steps he'll be taking over the coming months to address the lack of housing supply across Ontario? The Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. Speaker, and I want to thank the, uh, the member for his tremendous advocacy on the housing file in his riding. He's right. Our government policies under the Housing Supply Action Plan are working. Uh, we're getting more supply, but there is much more that we can do, Speaker. Um, you know, the member uh, notes that uh, we're inviting municipalities uh, to the table to discuss what we can do together to build more homes and make housing more affordable right across Ontario. So last week I was pleased to announce that uh, on December 16th, Premier Ford and I will be hosting a provincial municipal summit uh, for Ontario's big city mayors and for regional chairs to identify further opportunities to collaborate as we continue to work diligently on the housing crisis. Our goal for the summit speaker is for everyone Response. to lead with a collective understanding of what can be done to tackle the issue of housing affordability, and we want to emerge with a renewed sense of commitment by the two levels of government. Speaker. The supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the Minister for that response. We know that our government's housing policies under more homes, more choice, are working to make housing more affordable by increasing the supply of the full range of housing options. And we need that full range of housing options, not just one simple option. To make home ownership more affordable for more people, more needs to be done. Speaker, if we're serious about addressing the housing affordability crisis, we need all hands on deck. We must have our municipal partners at the table working with us. Can the minister please let us know what tools he has provided municipalities with so they can unlock the much needed housing in their own communities? Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. Speaker, and again, I want to thank uh, the honourable member for that great question. Uh, we've already heard uh, much positive feedback from municipalities who look forward to meeting with the Premier and I in December, and also the meeting we'll be having in January at the Rural Ontario Municipal Association Conference. But, Speaker, we do uh, need our municipal partners to put the good use to put to good use the tools that we've given them as a government, and this includes measures such as the community benefits charge uh, and allowing development charges for 
or rental and nonprofit housing to be spread out over a greater period of time. We need municipalities to work with us to increase the supply of all kinds of housing. And I look forward to joining the Premier and our municipal partners next month as we look for progress through continued partnership so that we can identify the new opportunities to collaborate and to get shovels in the ground. We need to build Response. more housing and we need to build it faster. Right. Question, the member for Algoma Manitoulin. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Premier. Winter is upon us all. In Northern Ontario, snowfall led to closures of Highway 17 and 11 recently. With it, over 24 hours to reopen in some cases. Residents of Dubreville were dismayed to learn that the section of Highway 17 were closed from Sault Ste. Marie all the way into Terrace Bay because of the weather. Winter road closures are nothing new in the north, but what really upset the people in Dubreville was that Highway 17 closure was not posted anywhere on Highway 519. People drove out to Highway 17 in poor weather on uncleared roads only to find out the highway had been closed. Speaker, the residents of Dubreville feel completely let down by the lack of proper road maintenance and road closure notices. Will the Premier finally admit that this government is continuing to fail Northern Ontario and commit to improving road winter maintenance on all our highways? The Parliamentary Assistant and Member for Scarborough Rouge Park. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thanks to the member opposite for that question. All of us in this House share the goals of a safe and efficient highways network across our province, particularly in Northern Ontario, where winter months pose significant challenges for drivers. Ontario has among the highest standards in the entire country to achieve bare payment following a snowfall. There will always be exceptional circumstances during a winter storm. And that said, our review of winter maintenance operation on Highway 17 and Highway 11 in 2020 confirmed that we are meeting or exceeding all clearing standards for these highways. And last winter, we achieved bare payments on highways, uh, Highway 13 and Highway 11 96% of the time within 12 hours following a snowfall. That service Response. commitment is to meet the bare payment standard 90% of all time average across the province. And we have a high track record on highway safety. Thank you very much. And the supplementary question. Speaker, again to the, pre, uh, to the Premier, making sure that highways are clear of snow isn't just a matter of convenience for people living in the north. Poor winter road conditions cut people off from essential services, prevent us from getting our goods to market, and lead to fatal highway accidents far too often. All of last week, from my writing, people were contacting my office about the terrible driving conditions and road closures on Highway 17. People like Catherine, Catherine Leclerc, who told me her trip home from Thunder Bay to Wawa was one of the worst winter trips she has ever taken. Speaker, people cannot wait days after a snowstorm to use the highway. Will the Premier ensure that the people in the north are able to travel safely this winter by making Highway 17 and 11 a Class 1 highway? Once again, the member for Scarborough Rouge Park. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. More winter maintenance equipment have been added to our fleet. There are over 1,100 pieces of winter maintenance equipment ready to be deployed to keep our highways clear, even during harsh winter storms. And we have increased the proactive application of anti-icing liquids in advance of winter storms and the number of winter maintenance equipment available for fighting the winter weather. Mr. Speaker, in Northern Ontario, in particularly Highway 17 and Highway 11, MTO is installing an additional of 14 road weather information system in stations, including along highway um, along these particular two highways, 17 and 11. Over the last few years, we have hired over 20 new inspectors and coordinators and provided them with the tools to effectively Spons. ensure our contractors are meeting our highest standards, Mr. Speaker. Again, we will make sure that standards for clearing to help Northerners get where they need to go faster and more. Thank you very much. Very much. The next question, member for Chatham-Kent-Leamington. 
Uh, thanks, Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Health. Late last year, my daughter was expecting her first child. Initially, doctors had recommended against expecting women getting vaccinated. As any dad should do, I told her not to get the vaccine, and she complied. Thankfully, on Valentine's Day, she gave birth to a healthy baby girl, Shiloh. I shed tears of joy. But a few months later, doctors said it was okay to get the vaccine while pregnant. What testing had been done to ensure the safety of both the mother and their unborn baby? But now, Minister, I shed tears of sorrow. In the Waterloo area, 86 stillbirths have occurred from January to July, and normally it's roughly one stillbirth every two months. But here's the kicker. Mothers of stillbirth babies were fully vaccinated, and you've clearly said on numerous occasions that the vaccines are safe. So, Question. Minister, what do you say to the doctors who told expecting women it was Order. okay to get fully vaccinated, and what should they tell the mothers who deliver a stillborn baby? Minister of Health. Thank you very much, Speaker. And first, uh, congratulations to you for the uh, birth of your grandchild. Uh, that is wonderful news, but it is also safe. It has been tested. We are recommending that women who are pregnant do receive the vaccine for the protection of themselves, protection of their baby as well. And that is, uh, has been proven. It has been accepted by the uh, uh, Health Canada, by the World Health Organization, by the FDA. Um, and this is something that we want to make sure that we can protect everyone. Women who are pregnant, it is entirely safe and recommended for them to receive the vaccine for themselves, their own protection, the safety of their loved ones, and the safety of their community. A supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker. Back to the Minister. Minister, look, I make no apology for continuing to ask you about reputable clinical trials and exposed side effects seemingly occurring in more and more people. I've been asking you in the science table as far back as when I was in caucus. I often questioned the efficacy of the data, even their modeling as to expected COVID cases. But now we're hearing reports of yet another variant, Omicron, which is being brought in from South Africa. Don't you find it ironic how since only double vaxxed people can fly and they are the carriers, not the unvaxxed? As usual, I'm certain mainstream media will see this as an opportunity to inflict fear back into the minds of Ontarians. So through you, Speaker, my question to the Minister is, are you planning another lockdown to contain this variant, which seems to have affected only a very few people? Is this going to be deja vu question. all over again? Minister of Health to reply. Well, what I would say to the member opposite is that we don't know enough about the Omicron variant right now. There's still much we need to learn. We don't know if it actually originated in South Africa right now. We don't know which countries have it, but we are taking our uh, every step possible to protect Ontarians. We're working with the federal government to make sure that the borders are closed to people from seven South African countries. But there may be more countries that we need to add on since the cases that have been identified in Canada uh, actually came from Nigeria. So there's much more work that we need to be done, and we'll take the steps as we need to take them. Dr. Moore has been very clear that we do have the plan to reopen Ontario, but if there is a major concern that is prevented by, presented by this variant, then we'll have to reassess. But we're taking every step now to do the necessary testing Response. of the 375 people that have been identified as having traveled during that time period. We're going to test, trace, isolate and quarantine as we need to for the protection of all people in Ontario. Next question, member for Niagara Centre. Thank you, Speaker. Through you to the Minister of Health, Niagara is experiencing a crisis with EMS services. Members from the Niagara Region Emergency Medical Service are expressing grave concern that they are understaffed, under-resourced, and burnt out as demand for emergency services continues to rise. Joe Bernarski, president of QPU 911 and an active paramedic, stated, Patients who call 911 frequently have to wait for long durations to have a show up at their doorstep because there are no ambulances available. The Niagara Region Public Health and Social Services Committee has stated that the current situation has reached a critical state. It's been reported that there are often not enough ambulances to provide emergency coverage for all of Niagara and to meet response times for critical patients. Will this government support paramedics in their work and commit today to hiring more full-time paramedics, more full-time dispatchers, and ensure that the people of Niagara call 911, they get the timely care that they deserve? 
and to respond to Minister Hall. Thank you very much, Speaker, and thank you to the member for the question. It is very important that people across the province of Ontario receive timely access to medical care through uh, ambulance services, and uh, we really appreciate the work the paramedics have been doing. We know that health human resources are, are stressed right now. That's why we're putting more money, hundreds of millions of dollars, into training for more uh, nurses, registered practical nurses, personal support workers, and paramedics. Right now, we have community paramedics that are working in health, as well as in uh, long-term care, to make sure that seniors who are at home are going to be able to be supported if they're waiting for a long-term care space or if they want to remain in their own home with the supports that they need around them. We are providing those paramedic services, and we are working to integrate that with the work that health is doing to provide the nursing and other services that Response. people might need. So there, the work is continuing, and uh, we will make sure that everyone, including in Niagara, receives the services that they need in a timely manner. Supplementary question. Speaker, in the last seven months, nearly 350 patients in Niagara were left stranded for four to six hours due to offload delays. 63 people spent more than six hours on EMS stretchers because there simply are not enough hospital beds. While the people of this province are laying on stretchers, this government spent le nearly half a billion dollars less on health care than it originally planned. The money was available, this government chose not to use it. The Premier needs to explain to the people of Niagara why he chose not to spend on health care while our family members are stuck on EMS stretchers. Will the minister commit today to fix the Niagara 911 crisis? Thank you. Well, I believe I answered the, uh, the first part of your question in my earlier response, but I think it's also really important to concentrate on uh, what the actual situation is with health care spending. As we announced in the fall economic statement, our government has invested an additional $5.1 billion this year and allocated an additional $5.2 billion next year in dedicated COVID-19 health funding. The Financial Accountability Office, which is what I expect that you're referring to, reports on a quarterly basis the spending variances between planned and actual spending at a point in time. So while the spending may not have happened in Q2, the, a lot of the spending is, is already happening now and will be reported later because the uh, FAO's point in time figures do not necessarily reflect the Spons. government's overall spending plan. So what I can say is that the $974 million in lower than expected spending is going to be caught up as we move towards the end of the year because of the timing of when the trans. Thank you very much. The next question, the member for Ottawa South. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And my question is for the Premier. So families depend on their government to be ready, especially right now. And the Premier's three temporary paid sick days are set to expire at the end of December. And we know that families are going to need those paid sick days to stay home with their sick, take their children to be vaccinated, maybe get a booster shot themselves. British Columbia and the federal government have moved to make paid sick days permanent for their workers. So, Speaker, we're not out of this pandemic yet, and families need to know that we have their back. And it shouldn't always have to be a fight to get what they need. So, Speaker, will the Premier do the right thing and make paid sick days permanent by passing Bill 7 today? To reply, the Government House Leader. Mr. Speaker, uh, you'll find that uh, the reasons why we did not support uh, the proposals that were brought forward by the Liberal Party and by uh, uh, um, uh, their leader, Mr. Del Duca, was that it uh, uh, sought to put the burden onto our small, medium, and, uh, and large job creators in the province at a time, of course, when they were having challenges because of the COVID uh, uh, pandemic, Mr. Speaker. So we went into a different direction. We worked with our, uh, our federal partners to bring in a program that uh, uh, had uh, 23 uh, paid sick days for uh, our uh, essential workers, Mr. Speaker. We went even further than that uh, uh, by, by bringing in, excuse me, a, a, uh, an additional three days for, uh, for our workers. And these days were our, uh, allow our workers to get to whether it's vaccinated, Mr. Speaker, whether they have to stay home with a loved one who has uh, COVID there, really uh, can be used for a number of factors. Uh, and we went even a step further Response. than that, Mr. Speaker. We ensured that we were the first government in the province of Ontario to protect all workers uh, when it came to uh, job security during the COVID uh, crisis, Mr. Speaker. Much supplementary. 
Thank you, Speaker. And if the minister read Bill 7, he knows that his assertion isn't correct. In any event, families also depend on us to protect them. And since vaccinations for 5 to 11-year-olds have started, we've seen a rise in anti-vax protests, protests directed at our kids. Children and their families in Windsor, North Bay, Barrie, Ottawa, and other communities have been intimidated when trying to get their vaccines. And our frontline health care workers continue to be harassed just for trying to do their job. And the Premier's response to this has been to do nothing. Zilch. He's always looking for somebody else to take action. Ignoring this issue is a failure of leadership, and it's letting down our families and our kids and our health care workers. Question. So, Speaker, will the Premier take action today by passing Bill 2 or introducing his own legislation to create safe zones around vaccination sites to protect our kids, our families, and our health care workers? Mr. House Leader. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Now, of course, the member will know because he served in government for uh, a number of years and was part of a party that uh, governed for uh, 15 years, Mr. Speaker. The member will know that there are already resources and tools in place to protect uh, uh, individuals, uh, in particular those right now who are seeking to get vaccines and want to be safe, Mr. Speaker. But he mentions uh, in his question that uh, his bill has changed. Well, how surprising, colleagues. The Liberals have changed their mind on something else. They flip-flop back and forth, Mr. Speaker. Now, yesterday he talked about the government taking some time to bring in sick days. I have to remind the member that he had 5,110 days to bring in paid sick days when he was a member of government. That's 5,110 days to bring in two paid Order. sick days, Mr. Speaker. Now, we've brought in three paid sick days as part of a $1 billion program, Mr. Speaker. We didn't put the burden on small businesses like the Liberals and the NDP, frankly, wanted us to do. Instead, we ensured that our small, medium and large job creators, that our essential frontline workers had access to paid sick days, Response. that their jobs were protected, Mr. Speaker. It didn't take us 5,000 days, Mr. Speaker. It took us a lot less. And we'll concludes our question period for this morning. We now have a deferred vote on a motion for closure on the motion for third reading of Bill 27, an act to amend various statutes with respect to employment and labour and other matters. On November the 25th, 2021, Mr. McNaughton moved third reading of Bill 27. On November 29th, 2021, Mr. Pizzuto moved that the question be now put. The bells will ring for 30 minutes, during which time members may cast their votes on Mr. Pizzuto's motion that the question be now put. I will ask the clerks to please prepare the lobbies.